We are closing our series today, though, uh, the original GPS. So our GPS is God's positioning system. And we're closing that series today. We're talking about finding God's blue line for your life. You know, when you open up your navigation and you got to go somewhere, even in town, I went somewhere in Lodi. Lodi is not that big, but I didn't know where I was going. So I had to plug it in. And I was like, I feel like I live in the Bay Area. I don't. It's Lodi, but I'd never been there, you know, and I didn't want to miss it. So you follow the blue line. That's what we're talking about, following God's blue line for our life. And there's a couple ways that you can follow along. Today, we do encourage note-taking, engaging with the content. Uh, all the scriptures are going to go up on the screens. If you grabbed a bulletin on your way in, there are message notes. You can follow along there. We have a couple of fill-in-the-blanks just to keep you awake. You know, not that we're boring in any sense of the way. But, you know, you work nights, and then you just got here this morning. So <laughs> uh, we have those. And then we also have the YouVersion Bible app. If you have that, you can just get to the events tab find Lifeline Church, and you can follow along that way. That one's cool because you can save the event, uh, and then you can refer back to it later in the week, which I love. So that's all that. Uh, let's jump into, you guys ready? Let's get into the content. Let's just do it. So today we're talking about, as we close the series, we're talking about how do I discover my calling or my purpose? In life, and this is a big question that some of us circle back to. Maybe, maybe we've never thought about it. Uh, for people in the church, people in the church think about it a lot, though. It's like, what's my, what's my purpose? What's my meaning? What am I called to? What am I, what am I created for? Uh, and maybe sometimes you would say that you've looked around uh, in your life and you felt like everybody else is better than you. <laughs> Anybody ever been there? Like you've been in some room or some environment or some place, and you're going, man, I don't know. I don't know how I fit in around here. You know, I don't like, I look at them, I look at them and I'm, I would say that I'm not, I'm not like them. I don't, I don't get that. Whether it's our workplace or school, maybe it's like a group of friends. All of a sudden it's like something just doesn't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know where I fit in at life. And what we like to say around here, and we believe this is that everyone is a 10 somewhere. Like you're a perfect 10 somewhere and you're like, great. Where? <laughs> Where am I a perfect 10? Uh, well, you would say, what was I, what was I made for? And, and how do I even find out? If you believe I'm a perfect 10, then <laughs> you got to show me because I don't, I don't know where it is. I want you to listen to this good word uh, that Paul, he's an apostle, and he gives this good word to the local church in Ephesus. It's at Ephesians 2.10. It says this, Paul's writing to the people of the church, and he says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So start out with encouragement. There are good things that God has created beforehand, planned long ago that we should walk in them. And so immediately, I've got questions. Like, okay, namely, my first question is, what are, what are the good things you planned for us to do long ago? God. Like if you created them at like what, cause sometimes I feel like, I don't know. You have been like, I don't know what the good plans are. That's, that's great. But, but what does it mean? Listen to the verse from the new King James version. Same verse says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And I wanted to pull out, we should walk in them. Cause I was like, what does that mean? What do you mean we should walk in them? So that's optional. <laughs> should is optional, you know, not that you have to, he didn't command us to, he did later, but here he says, you should walk in them. So I'm like, what does that mean? When I pulled it out, should walk in them means to regulate one's life or to conduct oneself. Taken from the original language, it means to regulate one's life or to conduct oneself. So in other words, we should regulate our lives or conduct ourselves by the good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us. So when we're talking about purpose, we're talking about calling, this kind of helps give us some, because that can be so broad. What am I called to do? What am I created for? And you know, I'm just like any one of you guys, we're all the same. We all want to be unique. You know, like I want to be the special one. Anybody? You, you, the Lego movie, you're the special. You know, like we all want to be it. We want to be special. We want to be different. We want to be so set apart, uniquely made. And we are, but there's a collective calling. There's a collective purpose that he's given to his church, to his people. And so there are good works that we should, the, the good works are walking in those things, regulating our lives based on what he has laid out for us. And then I went into this deep dive on the words called 
and purpose in scripture. Because we, the church, a lot of times can make a big deal about what's your calling, what's your purpose, what are you made for? And we believe that here at Lifeline Church, if you go through growth track, you want to get on the dream team, serve on the dream team, we're going to give you, we're going to, you're going to go through a test. You're going to find out your personality. You're going to find out your spiritual gifts. And we want you operating in the place where you're a 10 because you're made for it. But there's a discovery process in there. And I wanted to look at what the word says about calling and purpose. And this is what I found out. So there's two, there's lots of them, but I'm bringing you two talking about purpose. This is how the scripture would define purpose. One, it's a setting forth or an intention. You have been intended for something or you have been set forth for a purpose. And then there's another one. Purpose means to take counsel or to resolve to purpose to do something is to resolve to do something, to take counsel and resolve to do something. And so both of those apply in our context. And then there's the word called. Called in scripture, I'm going to give you two definitions. One means to be divinely selected and appointed. You are divinely selected and appointed for a thing or for a purpose. And then called is to invite properly. So come over to our house and like anybody who believes me will show up in my house, you know, if I give you the time. That's a general invitation. But a, an invite proper is I sent you an invitation in the mail and I handpicked you to be at my party. I handpicked you to be in my presence. And that's the other definition of the word called. You have been invited properly into my presence, into, we're talking about the Lord, into my presence, into my plan and for a purpose. So if we're talking about GPS, we're following God blue line for our life. Today, we're we're specifically looking at his purpose for our life. What is it and how do I live in it? I want to give you my working definition. You guys good with that? My working definition to answer the question, what is my purpose in life, is that you have to answer three other questions first. (laughs) Okay. In order to get there, you have to answer three other ones first. This is what it is. Number one, And this is not in your notes. So if you think it's good, you better jot down, jot down quickly. Okay. You have to answer these questions. Who, number one, who has purposed me? Who has purposed me? Or who gives me purpose and where does my purpose come from? Because to answer it, you have to know where you came from. So where does that purpose come from? And then number two, how am I to live out that purpose? Because if I didn't create my purpose, somebody else created it for me, then there's a plan to fulfill it. And it's not my idea. It's somebody else's idea. So there are answers in how I fulfill that purpose because it has been given to me. I'm not making it up. I'm not conjuring up. I'm not the inventor of my purpose. It's been given to me. So then we answer that question. Uh, where does my purpose come from? How? And then the next one is, how am I to live out that purpose? Or what does accomplishing that purpose look like? What does it look like? How do I know that I've accomplished that purpose? Or how do I know that I'm winning? How do I know that I am doing it? So when we, when we get, when you break it all apart and you start to answer all these questions, you get some alignment, you get some clarity, you get some direction, you get some boundaries on how to answer that question. And then the last one is what am I purpose for? Or that big question, why was I created? <laughs> Why was I created? And so I would say, (laughs) those are a lot of questions. Like if you wrote those down and you stop and think about them, those are mind boggling, deep, earth shattering sometimes questions. What's my purpose in life? Who made me? How am I to live out that purpose? What was I purposed for? Like, why was I created? And so this stuff, we're going to get into it. This stuff is all over the Bible. It's all over the Bible, but to keep it simple and focused, I think the book of Ephesians, where we looked at that scripture, Ephesians 2 tens, you are God's masterpiece. The whole book does a great job of talking about this. Um, it does a great job breaking this apart and giving us a clear direction. So if you read the whole book, and I encourage you guys, Ephesians isn't that long of a book. So I challenge you this week, church, Life on Church, go home and read the book of Ephesians. Okay. Listen to me. The book of Ephesians is a letter written to the church. And after the fact, all of these titles and headings and chapters and verses were added. I want you to ignore all the titles, all the headings, all the chapters, all the verses. And I want you to pretend like 
Paul wrote you that letter. So there's no chapters, there's no verses. It's not, I'm going to read this part of the letter today, and I'm going to read this part of the letter tomorrow. No, you're going to sit down and you're going to dedicate a whole chunk of time to read the letter in its entirety, ignoring everything else except for the words that were written to the church. And I want you to read it. And this is what you'll see. There's a twofold pattern presented in Ephesians. First, Paul explains the new identity that believers have in Christ. You have a new identity in Christ Jesus, and he's telling the church who they are. And then he brings out, second, he brings out the implications for their new way of life. He says, this is what you've been called to, and this is how you live out your calling. This is what you've been called to, and this is how you live out your calling. If you go read the book of Ephesians, you'll find it. Ignore everything else, like I said, all those titles, and just read it, and you'll see that. And then as a bonus, at the very end, at the very end, uh, Paul cautions his readers that they are entering a spiritual battle you can find this in ephesians chapter 6 and as such he says they must arm themselves with all the resources that god has provided for them until jesus comes back for us so when i was when i was thinking about this i'm like i feel like i'm in line at disneyland for the indiana jones ride you know like adventure is out there and i'm only minutes away from it adventure i i and then all week i just wanted to be in the indiana jones line at Disneyland, like, come on, somebody, let's go. I love, it's my favorite ride. I love it. Adventures out there. When you read the book of Ephesians, that's it. Like you've been made new. This is how you're called to do it. And then take up everything because it's, it's an adventure and you're, you're going out there to do some stuff. So I just want to break this apart. The first heading is what we are called to. Let's find out what we're called to, what we've been purposed for and who purposed us. You guys good with that? So I'm reading out of the message version of the Bible, which is a, like, It's a paraphrase. So it's not word for word. It's a paraphrase. And I'm reading it this way because I'm going to read a lot of scripture. Okay. So the easiest way to read a lot of scripture is to make it conversational. So that's what we're going to do. Ephesians chapter one, verse 11 and 12. Paul's writing to the church, which includes us. And he says, it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. There's your purpose right there. Where's your purpose come from? There. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, He had his eye on us. He had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. Purpose comes from him. He made us for his purpose. We're going to jump to Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 6. It wasn't so long ago that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then you exhaled disobedience. Yikes. Uh, We all did it. Every one of us doing what we felt like doing when we felt like doing it. All of us in the same boat. It's It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with a whole lot of us. Hear this. Instead, immense in mercy and with an incredible love, he embraced us. He took our sin dead lives and he made us alive in Christ. And he did this all on his own with no help from us. Then, then he picked us up. And he set us down in highest heaven in company with Jesus, our Messiah. And then he keeps going, verse 7. Now God has us where he wants us. That's where he wants us. He wants us in heaven right next to Jesus. He says, now that I've done all the hard work, now that I've, I've picked you up, I've made a way, I've cleaned you up, I've, I'm cleaning you up, and I set you in my presence. Now God has us where he wants us. With all, with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. He says, saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten us ready for us ready to do work. We had better be doing. So that's, that was a lot of scripture. And I love that. I love reading out of the message because it's so practical. It's so simple. And when you just stop and look at it, it's profound and simple. This is what we are called to. You can write this in. If you're taking notes, you are purposed for life with Jesus. It's as simple as that you are created for life with Jesus. And when I say life with Jesus, I meant you are created simply just to receive 
all of the life-giving love that Jesus has to give to his people. When you look at all of scripture, Jesus was there in the beginning and he created us with wisdom. It was Jesus. He's the word of life. If you read in John, he's the word. He spoke. Jesus spoke everything into existence. And it says all things are created by him and for him. And then he calls us the bride. He went through great lengths to get his bride, his people back. This is profound. Our purpose, our simple purpose that we were created for is to be beneficiaries of the love of Jesus. To simply sit and receive all that he wants to give us. He made us for it. He did all the work. He made us and then he did the hard work of saving us. So you are purpose for, and you're like, that's guys, I know that, but that's too simple. Give me more. I'm telling you, you got to get rid of all the other stuff because purpose isn't about what we do. It's about who we are. Purpose is not about what we do. It's about who we are. And we try and find purpose in what we do. And so scripture, if we look at purpose and calling, it's who you are. It's who you are made to be. You are made to be in the presence of Jesus. You are made to be loved. You are made to be his bride. So as mind boggling as that is, it's the lavish love of the saver. So we're not called to be a striving people. We're not called to be a people who work hard to prove ourselves. We're not called to be people who are trying to earn our place in the world or in his kingdom. We are purposed simply as beneficiaries of his love. And I just want to say to you, would you let that heal your soul? Would you let that bring healing to the places of striving and confusion, the places where you feel like you don't fit in or you don't belong, the places where you feel like I've lived so much life and I don't know what I've accomplished. When I look back, I don't know what my purpose is. When I look forward, I don't know what it is. Will you let it heal your soul? That if you would simply be okay in the presence of Jesus, he will direct everything else. And that is your good purpose. When we stand before, if we're believers, when we stand before heaven, he is going to say, well, job, good and faithful servant for all this that you've done. But if you've done it not out of this, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So it's, that, it's I, want, I want there to be healing in our souls about what our purpose is and where it comes from and to be okay. And I wrestle with that. <laughs> I'm like anybody else. You want me to just be okay with, but I have to do something. You know, like I can't just do nothing in life. I'm made to do things. So we're going to get there. But before we do things, it's who we are. So now that we know, who called us or purposed us, which is God. We know that what we are called to or purpose for is just to be beneficiaries, to receive the love of Jesus, to simply be his bride and let him love us that way. Let's look at now what living in that purpose looks like. So the next heading is how we're called to live it out. How are we called to live out that purpose God gave us? Again, I told you I'm reading chunks of scripture. So this is all out of the message because it's easiest, except for this one, Ephesians 2.22. I have to remind us, this is out of the NIV. Paul writes to the church. He says, in him, which is Jesus, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So part of your purpose includes being a place where God wants to live. Uh, just to remind us, you are meant to be a place where God himself can dwell. You know what that screams? He really wants to be with you. He wants to live inside of you. So he's creating you and cleaning you up in such a way that I can live with you. That's part of your purpose. Now I'll jump into the message part. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Paul says, in light of all this, here's what I want you to do. You guys ready for some doing? Like, stop telling me about being. I want to know about doing. In light of all this, here's what I want you to do. I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. I don't want anyone strolling off down some path that goes nowhere. And mark that you do this with humility and discipline, not in fits and starts, but steadily pouring yourselves out for each other in acts of love alert at noticing differences and quick at mending fences. Okay. Like fits and starts. That's getting really excited about doing something, not thinking it all the way through and then dropping it. He's like, I don't want you to be excited puppies. You know, like I want you to be solid. Think through some, like do things, move forward, build things, do things, but do it with intention. Do it with clarity. Do it with thought. Consider what will happen before you set your hand to it. Don't get so nervous about your life that you have to accomplish something that you look 
nervous. You know, like you, you may be nervous about who you are and what you're supposed to do, but think through it and have confidence. That's what he's saying to the church. And then he says, acts of love, alert at noticing differences and quick at mending fences. That means be in community with other Jesus followers. <laughs> be in community with other Jesus followers. Serve each other. He says, notice what is going on in the lives of your brothers and sisters around you. And, and notice when things seem good and when things seem off. And then he says, don't just notice when they seem off. This is what we do. I'm going to tell you what we do. When things seem off, what we have a tendency to do because we don't like conflict and we don't like confrontation is we avoid it. Or we jump ship and run away because it's, I don't want to get, I don't want to, when things seem off, he says, don't just know it and then don't avoid it. And then don't jump ship, do the work of making it right. Notice difference differences and mend fences. That means you have to get the work in there. You have to work. To, a fence has two sides, <laughs> you know, like it's my house and your house. So to mend the fence, we have to come together and come to a place of agreement in order to mend that fence. He's saying, do the work, be in community, get in, get in conflict, <laughs> get in confrontation and do the work, work it out. He's called us to that. Ephesians 4, he's called us to that. You want to know your purpose for that? Okay. Ephesians 4, 4, he says, you were all created to travel on the same road and in the same direction because he's talking to you as an individual and he's also talking to the church the entire bride of Christ he says you're going together so stay together both outwardly and inwardly in other words don't just pretend like you get along with people really get along with them <laughs> which means we got to deal with this that this is what you're called to you want to live in purpose we work this stuff out Ephesians 4 7 that doesn't mean you should all look and speak and act to the same praise Jesus <laughs> it says out of the generosity of Christ each has been given his own gift so in other words, God is calling us to do life together, all of us, and to be unified in purpose. The purpose is that we are his bride and he loves us all equally, but that doesn't make us clones of each other. And it doesn't make us emotionless robots. So we've got our emotions, you know, we've got our ideas, we've got our gifting, we have our personality, we have our talent, and it's not one above the other. It's this is what I've been given, but how can I serve and bless you? And how can I receive who it is that you are, that you may serve and bless me, that we may both be built up together as the bride, as the church of Christ. We're called to messy, guys. If you want to know what we're called to and what we're purpose for, it's the nitty gritty messy stuff of life that we would rather just not. <laughs> you know, like I want a good life. I want it to be easy. I want it to be peaceful. I want the Lord Jesus to work out every difficult place in my life. And he says, yep, I'm going to <laughs> do it. <laughs> Stay in it. Okay. Ephesians 4, 25 through 30. He says, what this adds up to then is this. <laughs> No more lies. No more lies. No, he's talking to the church people. He's calling church people liars. He says, no more lies. No more pretense. Tell your neighbor the truth. In Christ's body, we are all connected to each other. After all, when you lie to others, you end up lying to yourself. Okay. Okay. Let's just think about it. I'm going to take one really easy one for a minute. If you say everything is fine. When it's not fine, you're not serving anyone and you're most certainly not serving yourself. <laughs> oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. No, it's fine. It's fine. I'm fine. It's fine. It's fine. No, it's fine. No, it's not fine. And you know it. You're a raging basket case on the inside and you're spewing at everybody around you, but it's fine. I feel like we should just burn and bury that word. It is not fine. Okay. Let's look up. I should have looked up the definition of the word fine because most things are not fine. Like there's things all the time everywhere. We got to deal with it. So to bury it under it's fine is a lie. It's a pretense. Let's do the work. Let's talk about the stuff. Let's be a family. Let's be in community. We got to, we got to get in there. This is what we are called to. This is what we are purpose for. Is it verse 26, 27, <laughs> go ahead and get angry. You, because you're going to get angry. If things ain't fine, you're angry. You know what I'm saying? Like you got to feel it. Hey, go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry, but don't use your anger as fuel for revenge. And don't stay angry, 
Don't go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. We all get angry. Big deal. <laughs> Big deal. You all get angry every day, probably. Or maybe it's just me. <laughs> but your anger doesn't give you permission to act foolish and destroy what God is doing in your life and in the lives of the people around you. You can be angry. We're all going to get angry. But you cannot use that as a destructive weapon. That's what he says. Deal with your anger. Know that you have it. But then turn it off. Give it to the Lord and do what he has called you to do. Verse 28. Did you, <laughs> did you used to make ends meet by stealing Thieves in the church, you thieves. He says, you're not, you, none of you. Ephesus, yes. They were liars and thieves, the whole lot of them. Just kidding. Okay, did you used to make ends meet by stealing? Well, no more. Get an honest job so that you can help others who can't work. And he says, watch the way you talk. Let nothing foul or dirty come out of your mouth. The church, come on. Come on, church people. Say only what helps. Each word a gift. Don't grieve God. Don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. Make a clean break with all cutting, backbiting, profane talk. Be gentle with one another, sensitive, forgiving one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. That's it, people. <laughs> That's it. That's what living in God's purpose for your life looks like. It's very simple. And those are the day to, those are the day to day things. Like every day you want to live in purpose. You want to know if you're living on purpose and in purpose, the way God created and called you, who you're called to be. You live like that. You're living in your calling and you're living in your purpose because that's who he made you to be. That's who he set you apart to be. That's what makes you special. We're the bride of Christ. He went through great lengths to be able to live with us and in us and to move through us. And it's because of the love that he showers on us and because of he loves the people around us as much as he loves us that's why we live this way we live this way because when we look around you're the bride of Christ 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 and in the same way that Jesus gave all of himself for me he went through great lengths to purchase me back he did the same for you and he did the same for you and he did the same for you so I don't have permission in my purpose and in my calling to treat people poorly. I don't have permission to pretend like things are fine and bury it. I don't have permission to because God has called us to something greater. And he says, I'm working everything out. It's you, the individual and us as the church. And so you cannot live in your purpose if you're not a part of a, a group of people. You're called to be built up into something brick by brick. You're only one brick. You can't build anything with just one brick. You need all the bricks. So we're called to and purpose for life in community. So you would say that's all fine and good. There's a lot of good stuff in there. And it's, that sounds really wonderful, Pastor Tiff. I love it. But in the nitty gritty of real life, what does it look like to live on purpose? Your real question is, but what's my purpose? What makes me special? What am I specifically called to do? I have to turn my microphone off and I have to do something. I am going to show you what this looks like, okay? <laughs> I was trying to figure out what I looked like in the mirror yesterday. Okay, I imagine that this is what most of us look like in some area of our life. When we think about purpose, we think about calling. We have the wrong size clothing on in some areas of our life, and we're trying to make it work 
hoping that we look good and that nobody will notice. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so what happens is, uh, first, this is my son's sweatshirt. I feel a little weird because this is my son's sweatshirt and it almost fits. He's eight, okay? It's a little tight. Like if I were to reach on the top shelf, I might rip it, but it's almost there. And it's, I'm like sweating in my armpits real bad because it just sucked it all up. It's hot in there. Okay, you don't need to know that. <laughs> These are my husband's pants and they also almost fit. You know, like I couldn't scale a wall or anything. You know when you can pull, Never mind. <laughs> like if you had to go to the bathroom and you don't have to unbutton them, they're probably too big. You know what I'm saying? Like, but we walk around sometimes, and this is how we feel like in life. When you're not sure if you fit in, you're not sure what, then the, the wind, one gust of wind would take this dumb hat right off, okay? So cute, so cute. This is what we look like. We're not sure where we fit in sometimes. And so uh, maybe, maybe it's in our job. Maybe it's in the church, in the place where we serve. Maybe it's in our family, wherever it is. We look around in life, and we're not exactly sure how we fit in or what our purpose is. And so we try and find the person maybe we look the most like, or the person maybe we can relate the most with. And we try and wear what they're wearing. We try and just do what they're doing. We try and, and I don't know what it is, but I think it's that. So I'm just going to do what they do, and hopefully I'll figure it out along the way. Hopefully it'll begin to make sense, and hopefully this, like, I'll magically shrink in size, you know, and it'll just fit, and I'll feel normal, and it will be good, or I'll grow in size. Whatever it is, we, we find our place like that, so we can tend to focus on our profession. And go, that, if that's my, 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 my purpose is my profession and what I do, what I give my life to the, and my calling, that's where it comes from. Maybe we focus on our skill, like some skills that we have or our role or our assignment. So maybe, you know, even in your job or your, your place of work, your assignment and your role changes within your company or, or within, within your, your skill set, things kind of ebb and flow. And you kind of focus on those places where you are, what your hands find to do, where, where you, I have to take this off because I feel echoey in there. Okay, but that's what we do. Maybe it's in church, maybe it's in our ministry gift. You know, if you feel like you know your ministry gift, whether you're a prophet, you're an evangelist, you're a teacher, you're a pastor, you're a shepherd. A lot of times in the church, what happens is we take our five-fold ministry gift, we assign that our calling, and then if our assignment changes, we forget who we are and we feel like we don't have a purpose anymore. We don't know how to use it. We don't know where we fit in. Uh, and so what we do is we, we just do what we do and we let those titles and comfort zones define us rather than letting the whole of scripture inform our purpose. We let job titles and we let ministry assignments and we let our skills be what defines us. And we say, that's my purpose in life. That's what I'm called to do. The problem with that is those things all change. In your lifetime, if you look back over your life, how many times has that changed? And yet you remain the same. You are who you are and God has still called you and God has still purposed you. And so our calling and our purpose has nothing to do with our profession. It has nothing to do with our skills. It has nothing to do with our abilities. Those are bonuses. Those are add-ons. That's how you're going to live it out. But that's not who you are. It doesn't come from those things. So I want to help you. I have to take this off. Sorry. Okay. I'm going I'm to leave the baggy pants on. <laughs> Let me help you though. As it relates to skill or passion, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. As it relates to your skill or your passion, what you're naturally good at and what you are so passionate about doing, don't try and be who you're not. Just be you. You don't know what you don't know yet. So just be completely who you are, where you are. Be good if you're, if you're going to fill in the blank. Be good at what you are good at. Figure out what you're good at and be okay with it. Know it. Sp spend some time getting to know yourself. Ask other people around you. Don't let them define you, but ask them, hey, when you think of me, what, what would you say I'm naturally good at? What, what, Tell, tell me, tell me, what do you think I'm good, what do you think I'm good at? Uh, let, let them do that. And so if you have, like me, I've done a lot of things in my life, in my short lifetime. I've been a missionary, I've been a pastor, I've been a board member, I've been a student, I've been a registrar of events, I've been a receptionist, I've been a ditch patcher, dis, dispatcher, I've been a mom, I've been a wife, I am a mom, I am a wife, I've, I've been a teacher. And you know what I've learned? In everything that I've done, I'm a bridge. 
I'm a bridge between people and I'm a bridge between organization. I'm a bridge between idea and process. I'm a bridge between here and there. I'm a bridge between things that seem disconnected. It doesn't matter where I've been at in my life. It doesn't matter what my job has been. It doesn't matter what role or assignment I've been given in every place. I'm a bridge. I'm a bridge. The Lord consistently tells me, and so I've asked him, I'm a bridge. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert. I can do a lot of things. I'm a quick study. I can pick up things quickly, but I'm not an expert anywhere. And I don't have a desire to be an expert. I don't want to give that much time to knowing that much about something. You know what I mean? Like, I'll be the bridge. I'll get you from here to there. That's all I want to be. I don't need to be the expert. I'm a bridge. Others I know are very warm and welcoming. They're very disarming people. They're like a beautiful house that has been designed with you in mind. They have the ability to make you feel right at home in their life. And so people come in and out of their lives. People come into their lives not even knowing they need help, not even knowing they're hurting or broken, but they walk away transformed having been in that house, having been with that person. Still others are very encouraging. They're, they champion people. They're like a, a microscope or a telescope. I couldn't quite figure it out. But they can take the confused, uncertain, unfocused stuff of life and they can bring clarity of purpose. This is, this, this is the way people are. They make things make sense in your life, and then they make you excited to do it. They, they're like a camera lens. They have the ability to focus and then show you a beautiful picture. You put any one of those three types of people in any role, and however they do the job would probably look different. Why? Because they've got different skills. They have different abilities. Their role and assignment isn't it. It's who they are, and they're going to bring what they bring to the table in that season. It's not going to look the same for every person. It's not going to look the same from generation to generation because it's you. You are bringing what you're bringing to the table because God has put you here on this earth in this time exactly the way he made you. So if you try and wear the shirt like they wear it, it's probably not going to fit right. It's going to be too small or it's going to be too big. You, I did This isn't there, but you will never get where you are called to go or be who you are called to be by following someone else's blue GPS line. <laughs> you can't get there. In, in your map, we can all take the same way. In your life, you can all take the same way because we're made differently. We have different roadblocks. We have different construction points. We have, we have all kinds of things going on. Second one, as it relates to your character or your role, so who you are or the assignment you're serving in, as it relates to do, those two things, imitate the why, not the what. Imitate the why, not the what. So whether you look up to a leader or a pastor, maybe you look up to a teacher or a boss or a coach because of where you serve. Maybe you look up to like your employer or an employee beside you, whoever you look up to because you're in a similar role or you have a similar assignment and you're simi similar in character. Don't do what they do. Know why they do what they do. Imitate the why, not the what, and then let their why inform your how. How you're going to do something is informed by the why of, of why it's happened. So for instance, uh, so many times I felt like I'm wearing other people's clothes. Like I've looked around when we first took over the church, I was 24 years old when I was installed as a senior pastor of what was then faith generations church. You guys, I didn't know what to do. So I just looked up to my 45 year old male pastor. I could not act like him no matter how hard I tried. Like I wasn't him, but for the longest time I tried to. And it wasn't until I got so frustrated that I went and I was like, okay, blah. Or even in your parenting. So moms, let's just make it relatable to, to moms and women. Like we parent certain ways. You know, we do certain things. Maybe you've never even thought about why you do what you do. You just do it. And then when you think about it, I've had some mom friends in my life. And so I've gone up to them and uh, gone up, I've been in conversation with them. And I've said, hey, I noticed that you do this with your kids. And it seems to like work really well. But when I try that, it doesn't work. What are you like? What are you? How do you? How do you? How do you do that? And what they, they didn't tell me how they told me why. And the why was they said, well, this is what we want to see. And we tried it like this. We've tried doing this and we tried doing this and we tried doing this. But when we did this, this is what works. This is what works for us. But we do it because this is what we want to see. The why is what's the end goal. The end goal is this is what I want my life to look like. This is what I want my kids to look like. This is how I want to be described. And this is the way that works for me. I have tried other ways, but this is the one I landed on. And this is what works for me. So you imitate the why, not the what 
What's your end goal? Where, who do you want to be? How do you want that to, to be defined? What do you want your kids to look like? What do you want your, your, your workplace to look like? That's the why. And then let it inform how you do it. It might not be the same as someone else, but it's like producing, you know, organic fruit rather than GMO. You know, like you will be, it will be an organic banana, not a genetically modified one. When you go to the grocery store, I don't know what genetically modified is. I don't know. And I've tried to produce it in my own life, not knowing what it is. I have tried to produce and it's been genetically modified. I'm trying to produce your results in my life and it's not, it's not going to work. Okay. You are God's masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do the good things he has planned for you. We talk about your specific purpose, your specific calling. Paul is writing to both of the church and the person because the church doesn't exist without all the individual people who make it up. This is both to the church and the person. You were created to be the beneficiary of the lavish love of Jesus. God has shared with you in his word what living in that purpose looks like. And God has a plan just for you with your skills, your abilities, your gifts, your personality, your background, your passions that are going to make a difference in your church, your family, your workplace, the school you go to. And so there are some ways that we can immediately apply this. Number one, if you're new to church, if you're new to Lifeline Church, you're new to church in general, some places that you can get some practical application to just be in community and discover who you are is by joining a life group and by getting on the dream team, going through growth track. Life groups are open. You can visit the back table, find a life group and get in community with people. And then you can join the dream team. When you serve alongside somebody else and you watch how they do things and you learn from them, it will translate to every area of your life. So join a life group and go through growth track. Growth track is happening next week, uh, 1230 after the second service, you can make plans to be there. If you're already in a life group and you already serve on the dream team, you're a part of the community of Lifeline Church. This is your family. This is your body. Stay connected. Stay connected. Stay in real relationship. Don't let things just be fine. Think about your life. Think about what's going on. Be in real relationship. Be in real community. Don't shy away from the hard things. This is what we are called to, and this is what we are purposed for, and we live it out together. So right now, I just want to pray, and I want to lead us through one very simple thing in prayer. That's this. We are created for life with Jesus. And so if we have lost sight of that in any place of our life, and we've forgotten to let him speak into some of our decisions and some of who we are and some of how we think about ourselves, then that's what I want to pray for. I want to pray that Jesus would heal those disconnected areas in our lives. So go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes. Father God, we thank you so much for your good word to us. We thank you, Father, that we are your bride. We are the bride of your son, Jesus Christ, and you love us with an everlasting love, and you have purchased us, you created us, you made us, you formed us, you have good plans for us. You have a life you have called us to live in relationship with you and relationship with others. Lord, and in the places where we've lost sight of that and we've made it about us, We've made it about us being special or us being different or us being better, or us having all the answers or us just being okay all on our own. Father, would you forgive us? Would you forgive us so that we can find healing and cleansing for our soul? May we be healed by the reminder that we are enough just in your presence. If we didn't do anything else, simply being able to receive your love is enough because that is what you called and purposed us for. And everything in our life is going to flow out of receiving that love. God, if there are places in our life where we're just trying really hard to do the work and to be the good person and to have it together, and it's not informed by your love, Jesus, would you bring healing to those places? Would you reveal that to us? And may we already begin to heal that anointing balm over our hearts and over our minds and over our lives. Would you already be giving us clear direction of next steps of how to make that right and to be at peace? with who you have called us to be and what you have purposed us for. With every eye closed and every head still bowed, I just want to give an invitation. If you don't know Jesus like that, 
where he absolutely loves you and he calls you his bride and he wants to give everything to you. If you don't know that love of Jesus and you'd say, I want to make Jesus my savior. I want to enter into that relationship. I want to be completely okay because I know him. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand into the air? Cause I'd love to pray with you. I'm not going to embarrass you. Nobody else is looking around, but if that's the decision you're making, I want Jesus to be Lord and savior of my life. Amen. Go ahead and church. Just repeat this after me. Father God, we're grateful. We were made by you. We were formed by you. You love us. Would you help me to receive your love? Would you fill me with your spirit? And would you lead me to do what's right in every area of my life? In Jesus' name, amen.